Oh yeah, welcome to the bonus episode of the Permaculture Pimp Cast, where pimp stands for permaculture is my passion. The only pimp cast on planet Earth where we discuss permaculture, preparedness, and practical living. All right, normally I'd say to my co-host here, who isn't here, what's up, son, but he's not here. Today, I got some other folks, and I am super uber excited to get to know them and have all of y'all. Please stick around. You're going to be glad you did for a whole variety of reasons. But we get hot before we get hopping and popping. Remember, this show, as always, is brought to you by Hickory Ridge Soap from TwoOldCrowsHomestead.com. Turn that simp into a pimp. Bam! Also, Heaven's Harvest, y'all. 10% off with promo code PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. Remember, do all of your sourcing at home if you possibly can. But hey, y'all, we got a guest on today that is going to show you how to supplement. She's done some extraordinary things, and I can't wait to tell everybody out there about all this stuff. But yeah, anything you can't get from yourself that you can't grow, that you can't get out of the, well, I don't want to get too far ahead. Anything you can't find out on this show, make sure you go check it out at Heaven's Harvest. Remember, promo code PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. That's going to drop 10% on you. Heaven's harvest. Yeah. Be there, be square. All right. Also, before I, you know, I'd be absolutely remiss if I didn't tell you about my number one sponsor. Well, actually, my number two sponsor from the very beginning. Anybody want to guess what that is? Yeah. I can't even remember right now. So I'm going to cover it later on in the program. <laughs> um. Okay, it's one of those writer's blocks. That's what happens when you work all day and then you work all night. So that's one of those things that happens. Actually, I just remembered that was EMP Shield. Okay, 50 bucks off with promo code PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. And remember, your number one threat out there is not necessarily going to be an EMP. Take it from an electrician, a journeyman electrician with 25 years experience through the IBEW. That's me. So your number one threat is going to be lightning. Or if you're out and about, things jump off. Look, you're not going to the club. You're going back to the crib. So be sure to do that. And if you want to tip a pimp, go check us out on the Fountain app where you can listen to all your podcasts over there. Remember, start with the pimp cast. And if you and remember, you do it in derivations of Bitcoin called Satoshis. I can never remember what that's called, but they're called SATs. SATs. So if you want to drop some SATs on some PIMPs, go drop it over there on the Fountain app. You can also leave some comments and we read them on the program. All right, y'all. So without further ado, I just want to, I want to, before I get into my guests, I want to tell y'all right off, there is a massive benefit to when you go to these gatherings and Back to the Land was the one that happened last weekend. And I met a lot of awesome people over there. And over and over and over again, People were just coming up to me saying, hey, you got to go talk to this guy, Tim. He's a soldier like you. I'm like, oh, really? Okay, I'll get around to it. But then, you know, a lot of people are hitting me up and I'm, you know, doing this and that. And then somebody else says, hey, you got to go talk to Tim and Sophia. She's got a book. And I'm like, okay, I'll, uh, who are they? And I don't know who they are. And then later on, Tim comes up to me. And um, I mean, we hit it off, or at least I hit it off right off the bat as soon as he opened his mouth, because I realized right off the bat, the dude is a highly intelligent uh, West Point grad. I won't hold that against him, but he was also a combat engineer like yourself, like myself here. And so from one sapper to another, man, it was really, really awesome. So when you meet a people, when you meet people that have this kind of overlay, you automatically, you gravitate to them. And then here's the, the icing on the cake. My wife loves to, she absolutely loves to cook. She's all about cookbooks, tons of them down there, but somehow can't figure out what to cook every night. But anyway, she's got a bunch of cookbooks down here. Now I'm joking about that part because she does really put them to use. And my goodness, I'm finding out, okay, not only am I cool with Tim, man, his wife's got this cookbook. I know Michelle's going to buy this. Look, y'all, we're going to cover a lot on this program, but like every other superhero out there, actually, we got a a dynamic duo of a superhero team here. We got Tim and Sophia, and how y'all doing? Doing great. Thanks for uh, inviting us onto your show, Billy. Glad to have you here. I, I mean that. So every superhero, and you guys are superheroes in my book, they always have an origin story. Okay, so Tim, I'm not believing you came from Krypton, so uh, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and kick it off and um, you know tell us how you got into this space, and uh, we'll kick it on over to Sophia here in a minute. Okay. 
Uh, well, thank thank you so much for having us on the show. It's been an awesome journey. And like you said, I started off in the military, went to West Point and served in the Army. So I was really good at doing what I was told to do. OK, and uh, coming out of the military, um, you know, we, we lived in the Silicon Valley. We thought we were living the dream, working hard, getting a stable job and, you know, making some money and uh, going on a vacation, a nice vacation every year. But, you know, the pandemic hit and uh things went topsy-turvy and we wanted to it really brought to light that we had no control over our food and that really woke us up shook us up we brought home some chickens we um started you know started a raised garden bed in our little quarter acre plot in the in the bay area and it took off from there from there it went to five acres on a five acre farm just outside of sacramento we learned, we went to Joel Salatin's farm and learned how to process chickens. And you know what? I was like, you know what? I don't have any bad habits, just like the military. Just I'm a blank slate. You teach me. And, you know, him and um, Daniel taught, taught us how to harvest chickens. And that was really empowering. We went home. Um, I went, I went big and bought like the extra large, uh, plucker and everything <laughs> from, thought, from Featherman. Yeah. And, we thought we were going to lose our jobs and we'd yeah, have to be chicken farmers. We thought, so we got the extra large. We thought it was going to be the end of the world. So we went big and, uh, you know, actually in hindsight, it was better that we went big because nowadays because of inflation, if you bought the small size, it's the same, it's the same cost of what we paid yeah. for that one. But any, in any case, uh, that was really encouraging and our farm grew. And we started looking. You bought a hundred ducks. A hundred ducks, yeah. We got a hundred ducks. We like <laughs> we're Asian. We like ducks. And and everywhere I went, I was asking, you know, how do you how do you process ducks? I had to look on YouTube, and that's how I found Fit Farmer when he was uh, doing processing ducks uh, at at Polyface. But um, we were we were talking to a bunch of hunting clubs, and they wanted to skin them, and so that was not going to fly. So we raised our own ducks, and we we did it ourselves. We we processed fifty ducks on our own. That was a lot. I don't think I'll process ducks anymore but from there it um it grew we were also in the real estate business so we i got into it in 2018 and i focused on veterans because i felt that that was a need being a veteran myself in the bay area where there's a lot of people with stock options and cash and i wanted to go to bat for the vets you know nobody was going to bat bat for them they want to use their va loan zero down and a multiple bid uh, situations, you can tell, you you know, you can guess, you know, how competitive that would be as a zero down. And so I was able to do it. Sophie got her, uh, well, she already had her loan. Um, she was a lender back in 2006, but she got reinstated and we worked together as a team. We were crushing it. We worked for Compass. We did Sotheby's, but we were just helping bets out. And, you know, Billy, you know, I always thought you just had to just suck it up and <laughs> And, and, and work at a job that you hated and just to, you know, pay the bills. But when I got into real estate, I really found my passion there. And I, which really surprised me because I'm introverted. I really don't like to hang out with a lot of people. But <laughs> um, I was finding it that in real estate, I'm working one on one with families, with individuals. I'm, I'm helping to solve a problem. You know, everyone wants, you know, everyone has a set budget and they want to they want to be in the best neighborhoods and whatnot. And I found it so fulfilling to be able to help veterans out, you know, give them a leg up. And we were really competitive, really successful at doing that. We did such a great job with it. Our career hit an all time high during the pandemic when a lot of the realtors that have been in business for 30 years didn't know how to pivot um, with the whole like, no, don't go to open houses and everything. But we were able to accelerate. But um, since we were in the real estate business and you're doing lending, Sophie's doing lending, she saw the writing on the wall, the interest rates started going up. And we said, you know what? We probably should start looking outside California. It's getting a little crazy here. We homeschool our children. We started looking around at other states. Long story short, we were looking for community. We ended up in East Tennessee. And now we have five acres out here. We have we found our community. We found mentors. We have Jersey cows. And we provide raw milk for our community. And Sophie is a Weston A. Price chapter leader. And it just leads into her book, but I'll let her tell you that story. But um, I'm going to close, I'm going to end with my portion by saying that, and I was able to pivot by taking the skills that I learned from the Bay Area and apply it directly here in East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I move fast. I move Silicon Valley fast. And um, 
I help other people look for land, but not only land, homesteads, you know, and it's very specific. And I know what I'm looking for because I'm doing it myself. (laughs) And that's what I'm talking about. (laughs) Hey, before we get into you, Sophia, I got a, well, first of all, do you prefer Sophia or Sophia? I I didn't know which. Uh, Sophie for friends, but Sophia Ing, if you want to Google me up. <laughs> Sophie okay. or Sophie, you're all right. I'll go with Sophie. <laughs> I like that because every time I say Sophia, I think about the color purple. Sophia, Sophia, Sophia. <laughs> either way, I mean, I, it's a it's it's a beautiful name either way, and beautiful people, folks. You got to check them out. But we'll get into that in a minute. Before we get on over to Sophie, first, bro, I got to back up a little bit, man. You talked about these chickens, or not chickens, but ducks, and being Asian. See, this is what I love about these folks, man. They ain't afraid to own it, just like I'm not. I'll openly admit that I got a genetic predisposition to like fried chicken, and <laughs> I don't care who I don't care who knows. It's what it is. I don't yep. know why everybody runs from this stuff. And I'm like, okay, I'll put the hurt on a bird, no matter what it is. I mean, <laughs> I've been known to duck. I mean, duck confit, you name it, man. I, I'll eat a duck from the rooter to the tutor. It doesn't <laughs> matter. But when we get down to brass tacks, this is what I love about them: is that hey, man. You know, what I said, just we're uninhibited here. Mm-hmm. I like the, I love the fact that you actually believed it. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, nobody here is going to be offended by that. So, yeah, I'll, I'll own that, too. So, yeah, uh, we so, live up with a lot of the Asian expectations and. and <laughs> no, yeah. man, I'm, I'm going to own it, man. So, you know, like I said, you OK, well, I ever, <laughs> you guys only live a couple hours away from here. Look, if I ever make it back up that way. Y'all want to deep fry some doggone duck? <laughs> yeah. I've been known. I've been known, honestly. My favorite fries on planet Earth are basically duck deep fat. fried in duck fat. Duck fat oh, fries. Yes. yes. All right. Yes. Definitely. Everybody's missing. Going. Everybody's missing the beauty of duck fat. I don't know why. Right. All those all these hillbillies around here, they'll want to go hunting duck. And then I'm like, y'all getting rid of the best part of it. Yeah. Um, in fact, they just hunt the duck and nobody actually eats it. I mean, the duck breast and all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, duck breast, duck a la ronde, duck and neck bones, popcorn duck, duck and rice, duck a la mode. I mean, you name it. I'll, yeah. I'll eat a duck. It doesn't matter. So before we <laughs> before I get too carried away, Sophie, I want to get in. Oops, knocking my mic over here. Um, let's hear about your end of things, um, because you guys have a compelling, interesting story and where you were and where you're at and where you're going mm-hmm. is honestly just jaw dropping all the way around. So, uh, Sylvie, why don't you give us your end of things? All right. So I was born and raised in Silicon Valley. I say, I like to say that I learned how to code before I learned how to cook. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, my parents were immigrants from Vietnam. They left in 1975 by boat came here to America, didn't have much, if anything at all, started from scratch. And my mom worked two jobs. So whenever she was home, she was in the kitchen. And that was the only time I saw her. So I was in the kitchen, I'd be in the kitchen with her, she'd show me, you know, how to, how to, how to butcher chicken, how to process it. And outside of that, if we went out anywhere, we'd go grocery shopping. And she showed me how to, you know, she would say, you know, everyone's buying an apple for a dollar a pound, but you have to know which apple is a good apple? Because, you know, which one has a stem, which one doesn't and, and all sorts of things. So I picked up a lot of that growing up. Um, And it led me to a career of being really wise with my decisions, such as so I, I, my career in the Bay Area was growth marketing, and then I moved into growth product, which means startups and companies want to hire me because I can make something happen with very little. And again, that goes just goes back to my background of not having very much and being forced to be in a position where what do I what do I do with what I got? <laughs> I love poker, by the way. <laughs> so um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of what it did, what it was. And I, I built up my career, uh, got to executive level in Silicon Valley and realized, you know, it was around the same time that uh, Joel Salatin spoke at Google headquarters. So I heard him speak and it was around the same time that I had my first daughter. And what he said just planted the seed for food and sustainability. I didn't think anything of it, but when it came to having her, I wanted to and, and six months into having her, you know, when you transition from breast milk to f- solid food, 
I wanted to start making applesauce for her. I just didn't like the color of the jars in the stores. That was it. And enough of these books from that were handed down from my friends, you know, it was like William Sonoma books, so nothing like healthy. It said, make sure that you source organic apples, make sure you source organic pears. And enough of these books said it where it made me question, okay, so then when do we switch her out to conventional food or are we doing it wrong? And it's been 12 years. We're here on your podcast talking about permaculture and you can mm -hmm. clearly see where the conclusion went after 12 years. But, you know, slowly but surely I started looking at all of our Asian spices and the in the um, refrigerator. And I remember one day I grabbed a black bag, garbage bag with my mom and I, you know, one by one, just tossed these spices is it had preservatives, additives and MSG in them and a lot of hidden ingredients that were unhealthy. So I realized, you know, and she came out and she ran and she said, what are you doing? What are we going to cook with? And I told her, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. And so for 12 years now, my mom and I have been cooking together. Uh, we found, I found nourishing traditions. So it's a, it's a sister companion book, the cookbook that I've worked on um, to talk about, you know, instead of sauerkraut and fermentation, we talk about kimchi. Um, instead of just chicken broth, we talk about using our chicken broth as with healing spices. So we're kicking it up a notch with a medicinal purpose. And then just really going back to the land. And, and that has been a 12 year journey for us to, to realize, you know, maybe we don't need all this technology. We grew up with all of it, but what can we pick and choose from our past that we want to pass on to our children? And a lot of it is, you know, when, especially when 2020 hit, we realized, sure, I can make a mean website. I can help you with lending, but ultimately in the end of the day, mm -hmm. when 2020 hit and all the grocery stores shut down and we were on lockdowns with curfews in, in the Bay area, I realized we didn't have the skills to feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that did it for, for us. We also noticed too, being you know out here in East Tennessee and getting to know the community, they don't ask you what you do. They, they ask you, what are your skill sets? You know, what yeah. can you do? And it's really interesting. It's not like they, they, they're going to go check out your LinkedIn profile, but they, <laughs> they want to know what you can do for yeah. the community. So, yeah. 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 That's, that was something that was remarkable um, to me as, as well, I've always, you know, for the most of my life, I've lived in rural communities everywhere, pretty much after high school. And, you know, I didn't really understand that until you just now pointed it out. I remember in some of the more affluent areas where I would occasionally hobnob, um, it was always they would begin conversations and always bugged me with, uh, well, what do you do? As if to qualify whether or not you're worthy for them to spend the next sentence talking to you. Correct. Whereas in some of the rural communities, I I can't believe I never put that together until now, until you just said it. Yeah. Yeah. Where it was, it was never. I don't know that anybody's ever begun a conversation with. If they did, it was out of genuine, you know, curiosity. It was never to qualify you. Where right. I always felt that's what was happening, in the more uh, hoity-toity kind of places. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here it is. I'm learning all kinds of good stuff. So. Yeah. So you made you made the transition from California, like so many have. I mean, some of my best friends around here, the Holler Homestead, they're from California. <laughs> Jason, that's so the land, they're from California. Um, Nate, he's from the Pacific Northwest, and his wife as well. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that, that have sort of uh, there seems to be something of a diaspora from California and New York to places like mm -hmm. well, basically North Carolina all the way down to Florida. Um, what talk to me? Because there's a lot of people all over. I mean, we got people all throughout the world listening to this podcast, and they're going to want to know how you made that transition. We're going to get into some of the other things as well. But um, what what made you? I, I understand you're thinking, okay, well, this thing just jumped off. Here we are in California, and I'm having serious questions as to how we're going to put bread on the table. But how difficult a transition was that for you, and what did it, what did it look like? Well, I think in California what really felt, you know, we, we wanted to stay in California. That's why, mm -hmm. that's why we bought our five acres up in Northern, you know, North of Sacramento. We mm -hmm. really wanted to be around our family, our friends. We didn't know anybody else, but uh, I think when it came down to all the things that we were feeling, the oppression really in 2020 and mm -hmm. what we decided we didn't want to do and where our hard line in the sand was, yeah. that was, that was the moment where we realized, you know, what are we staying here for? And, um, are these the people that we really want to be around if we have to continually try to convince people that things aren't normal, that this isn't right? 
we need to go find our people so we can start building. And, you know, I work in data, I, I work in spreadsheets all day long. So naturally, you know, over the years, it hasn't just been like, it wasn't just an instant, you know, decision for us. Um, there's a book by Skousen called uh, Strategic Relocation that I Oh, wrote. yeah, Joel Skousen, big jo fan. Yeah, okay. Big yeah. fan of his uncle, too. He wrote The uh, Naked Communist. Uh, his name was oh, Clean really? Skousen, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so then you know what I'm talking about. I had a whole oh, spreadsheet yeah. based off of that and even looked at, you know, nuclear fallout and rainfall and temperate climates and um, tornadoes versus, you know, earthquakes and things, hurricanes, all of that. Um, but really, rainfall was important for us because we were in – Lincoln, California, which when we were farming there, it, it would get up to 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so I remember one day, a couple of days during that week that it got really hot, mm -hmm. we would run out, Tim and I, and <laughs> just spraying down our trees, spraying down the garden. But I mean, the sun is beaming. So I'm sure you know, when you're spraying your garden, Killing it. You, you know, and the, the <laughs> hot sun is beaming on it, you're now burning your plant, but we, we yeah. didn't have another option for it. So that's when it, we realized water was really important and um, mm -hmm. went to go find community. And, and I was, I've been eyeing East Tennessee for a long time, never thinking that I was ever going to move out here, but I'd been a Facebook, you know, I was in all these Facebook groups years, years ago, Yeah, just admiring what people were doing and what they were growing, but thinking I could do it in California. I don't need to be in Tennessee for it, but it, you know, that kind of opened up my eyes to, Hey, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to make a move ever, cause it was January, 2022, because I do lending and I had actually just refinanced us three times mm. between 2020 to 2021, October, I got us down to 2.25% on a VA mm. uh, interest rate. Right. And, and I told him in January, I'm like, I think we're going to have to move if we're ever going to think about moving. And he said, we just refinanced. This is a great rate. And I said, yeah, but I don't know what's going to happen. All I knew was rates were going to climb and I didn't know how drastically they were going to climb. So I, I just knew we got to get out. And literally March, 2022, when we moved out here, we closed on this home and it was already climbing at nearly three and a half percent. Now we're at above eight and a half percent right now. Well, I want to add to it though, that we didn't, we wanted to make sure we didn't, we didn't move out of fear. Like a lot of people just wanted to bolt out of California, just pick any red state and land there. And we actually wanted to do our due diligence. We took our RV. We spent a week yeah. in Texas, a week in Oklahoma. I really wanted those states to work out because it would have been an easier transition near those bigger cities. But um, Sophie's the one that does a lot of the research. Um, she's the visionary. She's the CEO. I'm more the COO. I make it happen. Um, actually, I'll tell her logistically it's not going to happen, but then she'll make me make it happen. So <laughs> that's what happens, you know, and uh, we ended up in Tennessee. I really didn't think it was going to work that way because she was uh, in charge of finding homes out there and she didn't have anything. She just said, oh, a lot of people buy raw land and they plop an RV there. And I'm like, that's not appealing for me. I'm, uh, you know, we just got done fixing up our farm in California. And so nobody flips the farm, but it looks like we did uh, in that place. And we have a YouTube on that one. But uh, go ahead. Yeah, but so I we had 48 hours in, in East Tennessee and I had set up a luncheon of 12 different families. We yeah. had lunch and they were all transplants, new people from Oregon, from Chicago, from Massachusetts, all over New York. Mm -hmm. And I literally went down the line and asked them everything, you know. Um, where did they stand? What did they feel about Fauci? What did they do about masks? You know, where did the county, this is, we're in a constitutional sanctuary county. Um, and so one of the things that was also very important to us was realizing on the county level that we really wanted a sheriff that was a constitutional sheriff as yeah. well. Cause remember we're coming from California where Newsom was threatening us, yeah. uh, with the, you know, federal, mm -hmm. federally, he was threatening us with door to door health checks. And that did it for me. I'm like, you have no jurisdiction. And, and mm -hmm. it really came down to county level. So then, you know, we kind of woke up to that. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what, the audience right here, they're giving a massive amen. As soon as you say a constitutional sheriff, and I mean, I know you really haven't listened to the program much, but honestly, this is exactly why people tune in. Uh, exactly the reasons, and exactly the reasons why you got on the first thing smoking out of California. And strangely enough, went from one side of the country completely as <laughs> almost as far as you can possibly go to the other side. Um, yeah. So I, I'm glad you didn't stop in uh, Oklahoma and Texas because um, 
you know, I grew up in both places so, or lived in both places and grew up there. I, I, I joke about it with Sophie because, I mean, look at us. We're, we're Asian. If you knew where we live, it looks like we were in the witness protection program. We you know, <laughs> look like we belong where we're at. But I tell you what, we, we feel so much at home where we're at because of the freedom of thought you know, yeah. and the acceptance of freedom of thought here. Oh yeah. We're going to, yeah. You know, they're going to be repeat guests y'all with this kind of sense. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no getting around that. Um, let, I want to back up a little bit real quick, uh, Tim. Yeah. And uh, let's talk about your military career and what made that transition. Because as I understand it, I mean, you don't get to the, be the rank that you were, you don't ascend to that position by not at least halfway liking it. So why the transition? I mean, talk to me about that. I guess I was halfway decent. I I I, I joined because I liked the uniform. I liked I liked the history, and so um, I I did. I, I served, and I, I had a really good time. And um, it was I was up for company command, and my branch uh, manager said, "You can go anywhere you want, but you're going to go to Afghanistan. You're going to take you can take a company to Afghanistan." And I said, "Okay." So I I told Sophie, and we had just. Uh, Sophie's an entrepreneur, if you haven't guessed yet. We had just opened up a self-serving Froyo shop in Albuquerque. I was working at DTRA, uh, working down at White Sands Missile Range at the time. And I said, um, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. You, know, we, you can choose Hawaii and you can go to Hawaii, but I'm going to be gone in Afghanistan. And she said, no, you're, you know what? Uh, how much do you love the Army at this point? And I was kind of 50-50 on the line. And she said, well, we have a business now. We have a baby. You know, I we want to, you know, I want you out if you can, because we're not going to move. You're going to be a geographical bachelor. And so, um, I'm always going to put my family first. So I got out and then I joined the reserves, um, and got my company command time during that time. Yeah. yeah. You were in Iraq too, 2007, 2008. He got stuck during the Bush surge and was yeah. out for 18 months. I did. Yeah. Yeah. That was and, before. And that was the yeah. lowest of my low. And I mm. remember I told him like, if you want kids, we're not doing another deployment. I'm not putting kids through that. Mm -hmm. I think my only regret, though, was just that the opportunity to go back and teach at West Point. That was the thing. I wanted to go back and teach history there. But um, I'm, I'm teaching at our, our local co-op for the kids with our kids. And I'm just having a great time now. Although yeah. the running joke is we don't really know what he's teaching because he's now questioning all of history. Well, and <laughs> they, 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 they have me. They have me teaching geography and uh they asked if I want a globe. I said, I don't want a globe. Thanks. But I'll, I'll teach. I'll teach what you want me to teach there. I'm going to teach PE and PE is the number one class for a lot of the kids. They're, they're learning basketball. They had something. They were playing Gaga ball or Octoball. I don't know. I think it's a made up sport. And now they're playing basketball, like a real sport. So I'm like, okay, great. At least I'm having a positive effect there. <laughs> well, you know, it's, you know what? There's other modalities to teach because I also have that same bug. Um, but I teach now in a way I thought I'd be a history professor. I mean, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, for a whole variety of reasons, you know, there's an, there's other forms, I think, of academia. And I think we're in one right now. Mm -hmm. And it can be in the, in terms of vocations, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, I got a Ph.D. in pimpology over here. Permaculture is my passion. That's so nice. if anybody wants to know where my credentials lie, bam, right there behind me. Yeah. So. You know, I mean, there's other ways in which we can teach and other ways we can, you know, project our knowledge and regarding certain things. Absolutely. Um, so you got out and, um, you know, in a nutshell, I guess Sophie it. said, look, hey, man, get loose or get lost. I ain't going to have this, dude. You're not going to be on constant deployment, which you is know, honestly, it makes perfect sense. It, it has been a journey because she <laughs> she has always been pushing me outside my comfort zone so i got i got off got out of the army and got a stable government job working for the corps of engineers as a project manager and that was fine uh and then she said why don't you get in the real estate because one of our friends our mutual friends was in real estate and she was doing it part-time and she was working full-time at intel but then she was able to replace her income at intel in just one year so i said you know what introduce me to your broker again i don't have any bad habits i'm a clean slate just teach me and her broker's old school, like with paperwork and everything. And he taught me from, from the ground up. And I, and I just listened, soaked it in. And I just went and executed it, basically. I, I went and uh, helped serve ve other veterans, like I said. And I got successful. I was successful. I closed deals. And it was exciting. I, I, I guess I really love sales. <laughs> it's really fun. Yeah. What we're seeing now is the, so we've expanded 
beyond California. We're now serving Tennessee and North Carolina. Yeah. And what we're seeing is the market has slowed down significantly in California, mm -hmm. but we're dealing with the same kind of California market now in Tennessee and North Carolina. So we're doing the same types of negotiations and same types of deals, not just on price, but on terms. And mm -hmm. I mean, I can see him light up. He, mm. he loves it because yeah. there are multiple offers. In the last couple of weeks, there have been multiple bids on homes. Yeah. And he'll come in at the last minute and just, just swoop in. I like to swoop in and, and get it at the end. <laughs> But okay. yeah, that, that I, I see your excitement in it. Yeah, so and, and, and and like what Joel says, there's a tsunami of homesteaders coming now, and we are addressing that need. In fact, I'm looking for other agents who are homesteaders themselves or know what to look for so that I can create this huge network right now. Because, I mean, just recently I had to partner with a fellow agent out in Nashville because it's like a four or five hour drive for me. But that that cl that client wanted to work with me wants me still part of that deal so i am very much going to be land. part yeah. of that deal because he knows that i know what to look for that's exact hey there's so many people out there that i get the emails all the time like hey man i'm i'm hearing blah 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 i want to get out there by you yeah. um i know there's a high freedom quotient out there and i hear this all over so we're going to definitely for all the folks out there that are kind of chomping at the bit don't worry, we're going to give you their contact information for everybody out there that is looking to make that transition. Um, the, look, we all understand the world we live in right now, and I, I just want to warn everybody. Look, if you come from California, New York, I don't care where you come from, and you move to these communities, make sure you do it with the understanding that you are assimilating into their communities, these long-established communities. So, if you think you're going to go in there and like some of the people that, around where I live, and if you think you're going to roll up in there and tell these these old boys that have been up in these hills for seven, eight generations, hey, you can't process that deer on your front lawn. Well, guess what? Um, they filmed Deliverance up in these parts. In fact, the guy, that, <laughs> the guy I'm dead serious. The guy that um, just a town over, the guy that was, man, I better not even say, <laughs> he was in the movie Deliverance, basically was in the, in basically the county I'm in. So um, no point being is that if you come out from these areas, y'all, these are people that have a high, they, they're, they live for the freedom mm -hmm. and they're yeah. not going to tolerate people that come in elsewhere and trying to change that. Now, if you choose to assimilate into that, that's, that's one thing you will be welcomed by and large. So uh, just keep that in mind, but all the people out there that are looking to make that move, remember between, let me make sure I'm saying this right. Uh, Tim and Sophie, um, Make sure so you're a broker and help me out here. You, you two yeah. basically work as a team on this. We, we work together as a team. I, I handle the real estate, the buy and sell side of the house, and Sophie does all the loans, all too. the lending. Yeah. So I do all the math. So he does, he gets the fun job. He gets to go shopping with the clients. That's right. And I'm I have shopper. to figure out how to pay the bill. I get, I get <laughs> them to say yes. And then Sophie figures out how to close it. Don't worry, everybody. We're going to, we got more to cover here. So, okay. This is why they're so dynamic. The dynamic duo over here. So, okay. So on one end, they can get you squared away to find a place, but we're going to transition in into what Sophie has done. Um, Yo, I got to be honest with you. These two really knocked my junk into my watch pocket when I met them out there, because we were sitting here talking about, I thought it was just going to be real estate. And then next thing I know is I got over there and I checked out their booth and I'm like, what? They got this bomb cookbook because Michelle got over there. She saw that. She's like, okay, where, where do I buy this? Look, we're, we're going to transition into that. But uh, Sophie, you also, you're something of a food writer now. Uh, you have a cookbook. Um, tell yeah. us how that began. I mean, you kind of began the beginning of it a little yeah. while ago, but you know, tell us how that worked out. Why, why that happened. And it's not just any cookbook y'all. I mean, this thing has a forward, as I understand it, by Sally Fallon herself. Even Joel, the pimp daddy of Polyface, even got on board with this thing. Yeah. So you might want to check it out. So why don't you tell us how this was conceived? It was 12 years ago when my oldest was born. And when I started working with my mom, we found I found Nourishing Traditions. We actually went when, when he was... When, no, no it was before. actually a fellow Army buddy. It was a, yeah, it yeah. was while we were at Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base. Yeah. There was a family that we went to go visit, and we thought they were they had like crazy. Five, we, five, they had, five kids. No, they had eight kids, eight kids, and a dairy cow. A cow they they had... lived up in the mountains, mm -hmm. and we 
<laughs> we got invited to their house and she said, you've got to try raw milk. Oh gosh. And I thought I was going to die. She's like, so, so <laughs> we, were, we were in our twenties and, yeah, yeah. you know, young, didn't know anything. And, and I remember the one thing that she, she told me was she <laughs> gave me this yellow book and she said, this is the Bible of nutrition. Mm. You need, you need this. And it was called nourishing traditions by Sally mm. Fallon. And I flipped through it. It's a big, thick book. If you're familiar with it, no pictures, there's no mm. color in there. Just a lot of text. Yeah. And I just set it aside like, okay, okay. I, so I, I bought it on Amazon and then slowly I read through it mm -hmm. and, you know, I started cooking. There are some Oriental recipes in there and, uh, you know, my parents just couldn't, uh, they, they, they just didn't like it very much. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because it's not traditional. There are no umami flavors. And umami is that savory flavor that you have in like soy sauce, right? Mm -hmm. You have in uh, fish sauce, it's still, you know, and, and um, that is one of the reasons why a lot of Asian restaurants and condiments and sauces use MSG. So they hack this umami flavor without mm -hmm. having to cook uh, thoroughly or traditionally because mm -hmm. it's not cost effective. If you're going to a restaurant, it's easier to just put some <clears throat> MSG powder in there. But I'm I'm staunchly against it. I know it's very controversial, but here we are. I'm on your show. <laughs> they're, ma they're making it a race issue, Billy. And so look at us. We're Asian. We don't believe in it. So that's yeah. I'm working no. on an article right now to combat against that because now they're saying MSG is a racial issue if you speak up against it so much that Melissa Clark from Whole Thirty that that program she had to back away to say yeah MSG we don't have enough information okay. so MSG is approved. Hang on. Well, you know what? I didn't even know this was going to pop up here. Mm -hmm. Many people ought to research where MSG actually came from and what it was actually used for in World War II, as I understand it. And this is off the top of my head. I mean, I, you know, you could put me on Jeopardy for useless trivia for a thousand. I'd probably get this one right. But correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't MSG wasn't the result of uh, rotten food being brought to the Japanese army? And they basically used the MSG to give to make things that were unpalatable. Taste palatable good. that's right mm -hmm. yeah isn't that where it came i mean am i mistaken on this so why would anybody have any opposition to msg unless it was more of the big food lobby out there you know putting their foot down on this thing they the what was what is believed to have been said is that well part of msg is you know natural but not all of it is and we're, we're against any sort of chemicals that you add additives to the food but where it becomes a racist issue is that we believe is that because they were they believe that they're saying that they're being prejudiced against Chinese restaurants because um, Chinese, Chinese restaurants had MSG, but so did a lot of other foods growing up. I had chicken and a biscuit. I mean, they, they would call them yeast. Oh my food. goodness. They're well, delicious. I, I'm the allergic. Yeah. yeah. I'm allergic to high amounts of MSG. I can always tell when it's in something because I get this crazy dopey feeling like I'm on, That's you right. know, so, I mean, it, I could always tell when it was high. The, the only place where I grew up where you could go to anywhere and not get the MSG and get Asian food was this Thai restaurant. Mm. And um, it was the only place where they didn't use MSG. And if they would lie to me about it, because I'd call and find out, you can ask Michelle, I'd be doubled over as soon as we got out of there and I would just lose it as much as I put in. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty sensitive to those things. But if, uh, to this whole racist thing, y'all, let me just go ahead and well, I'm just going to own another thing. I am a racist. <laughs> I'm, not your divert, I'm not your version of it. And I bet Tim and Sophie are racist, too. You know what that really means? Rational and constitutionally inspired, sensible thinker. That's really what a racist is these days. <laughs> I like that, yeah. I like so, that. You know, I'm maybe I ought to get some T-shirts made with that. So I didn't mean to take you off your point. Nonsense. But, man, when they start talking racism over some nonsense like this, y'all, <laughs> I just come out of I'm just come out of the come off the top rope with this stuff. But you as know, you know, unfortunately, society today is if you call someone racist, the conversation stops there. You can't have a, a, an intellectual conversation, you know, with a threat of being called a racist. So, you know, um, so so you know, it's been over the the last twelve years, and and I had been thrifting. So we we had a wedding photography business. That was my first uh, business when we first got married. And that was because Tim was deployed for 18 months. I was depressed. So the only thing that got me out was uh, this Flickr. I don't know if you remember that, but it was a Flickr um, photography kind of photo storage. 365. You go out every day, you take a photo. And yeah. that was the only thing that got me out of the house because when he was deployed, we weren't married yet. There was a website 
that I would hit refresh all the time because it would have all the names of the soldiers that was um, harmed that day or deceased mm -hmm. that day. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't next of kin, I would have to wait for his parents to call me. So I was just this insane, like, you know, 20 something year old, just clicking refresh on this website and going insane. So I was like, you know, I need to get outside. So the camera saved me. And um, it was because of that, that, you know, when, so, so I have that in my background and when I started thinking about cooking and cooking with my mom, whenever we go thrift shopping, I would pick out these like plates and dishes and say, oh, this would be really great for this dish. This would be great for this sauce. And so over the last 12 years, I've had collected six cardboard boxes of thrifted dishware that have moved with us several times throughout the Bay Area to then the farm in California and then across the country. And um, my dad flew over here um, when we moved out here last year, uh, in August of last year. He has dementia and he was starting to decline pretty rapidly, um, starting to become nonverbal in, in California. So I told him, why don't you come over here, spend some time with us. So he came over and um, I was still working full time. So I was working West Coast hours. So my day would start early over here on the East Coast and I would do all my chores, all the homeschooling, all the food, taking care of, you know, every all, all the kids and everything up until noon because then I would start at 9 a.m. and I'd work from noon to eight. But dad wouldn't get up till noon. And so he'd be by himself, even I mean, I'm home, but I'm on the phone calls. And, you know, when you work at Silicon Valley companies, you really don't get a break. You're, you're in, you're in. So he started to decline a little bit more. And um, I told Tim, I said, I think I need to take some time off when September last year. So this time last year, I told him, I think I need to take some time off. Can we do three months off? Like just to just reset, I'll get some help for dad. And he said, absolutely. But, you know, what are you going to do with those cardboard boxes full of um, thrifted dishes? Because if you're not going to write this cookbook, that I've talked about for years, um, then donate it. And he was serious. He was very matter of fact about it. Like well, they were all Diddy moves. Okay. So I'm tired of carrying them by myself, <laughs> breaking my back. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a problem with donating things. So I, I said, okay, I'll take the time. Mm -hmm. Mom came over in September to help take care of dad. And I started getting serious about it. I wrote a proposal and I, and it wasn't supposed to be anything this big. It was supposed to be just writing down mom's recipes for the kids. I wanted to pass down mm -hmm. her traditions because her memory is starting to go too. Yeah. Not as quickly as dad, like her, you know, but mm -hmm. I still wanted to capture that while I still could. Well, you know, throughout the year we've taken them up to Joel Salatin. I mean, they've heard about him. Uh, I've talked about him, but they, they finally met him. They met Sally Fallon um, we've gone harvesting together. We've visited different farms with our RV. So they've, they've met our friends. Um, and ultimately, um, just, you know, so, so that was September, uh, Chelsea green publishing company is a very respectable, um, publish I, like a half of our books in our library are Chelsea green books. They're all about regenerative farming, you know, sustainable living beyond organic practices and really good food. They're not really known for their photos. So I, uh, I, they reached out. They said they heard our story. By the way, I had removed everything off of social media. I just became a huge skeptic, right? After being on Facebook for 17 years, I just got rid of everything. And um, Chelsea Green, <laughs> so by the time they heard our story, they're like, how many people are following you? How many? And I said, I got off of social media. And I said, okay, well, we're going to need you to ramp back up because we love your story. We think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You're a military, you're tech, you know, you're Asian. Mm -hmm. You're doing the things that people say they want to do, but they don't do. Right. And we think it's a great, you know, cookbook that's missing in the market right now. So um, by by November, we signed up, I signed a book deal with Chelsea Green, which is by the way, a very hard thing to do. Chelsea Green gets, I think, 800 submissions annually. It only chooses 30 titles. And that could mean, you know, they're past authors too. So, you know, they really took a chance and they really took a risk coming, going with me, but they really thought that the story would sell. So that was uh, November. And then by February, I was supposed to submit the entire manuscript. But January, my mom and I flew to California for a Vietnamese church conference. 
And my one of my best women from my wedding, she works as a Hollywood producer um, for celebrity chefs in Hollywood. And I asked her, hey, can I, I'm going to be there. Can I just shadow you? You showed me how to use, you know, camera lighting and everything. And she said, and I told her I'm writing a cookbook. And she said, fool, <laughs> you're going to write a cookbook and take your own photos? I'll send a team out to you. So she said, book an, book an extra week with you and your mom. You're already going to be here and bring in your stuff. And I'll send a team out to you. And thank God she did because that team was amazing. He, they, they did everything that I had envisioned. And I was, so my mom and I cooked and prepared for 20 hour days uh, for a whole week. And I got sick at the end of it. I lost my voice. It was insane. But I was also the producer on the photo shoot because I had these images in my mind for the last 12 years. So I, I knew the dish and I knew the plate that I wanted it on. And so when I saw it, I told him I wanted West Elm meets anthropology meets crazy rich Asians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said I wanted the traditional, but I wanted to capture the modern too. I wanted city folks who shop at Whole Foods to think that, you know, they could feel inspired by it. But I also wanted the homesteaders like ourselves who want and who demand higher quality food and beauty to feel related to that too. And, and so it was a, you know, it's, it's, it's been a very emotional process. Um, my dad about two months ago, he declined pretty rapidly. He actually had a psychotic break. Um, and so unfortunately that means that he's no longer living with us. Um, he's in a memory care unit now and it's been, it's been really rough, but I realized that had I not said yes to this project, um, last year, this time last year, this cookbook would have never happened. I think this was the last year to get this book done. So it's bittersweet, but you know, it's all God and his timing is perfect. Absolutely. It's um, folks, if you haven't, okay, we're having something of a technical issue here. Um, yeah. I, I'll tell you what, I actually picked this book up and um, it was like picking up an anvil of, you know, the anvil of crumb. I mean, this thing definitely is not, it's just not 20 pages of a booklet. This thing was seriously professionally done. The pictures are just absolutely scrumptious. You look at it and you're like, good night. But where you overlaid so many things is that, you know, for those of us who are fans of Sally Fallon, um, I'm like, good night to get her endorsement along with everything else here. In addition to Joel's, I'm like, okay, man, this thing has really got to be the cat's meow. And where you were able to overlay all these different things, you know, the thing that I think what you really capture in it for me, and I was only able to thumb through because she had just basically a, not the, it yeah, was like, proof. Like, like a proof. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, I, it was kind of cool to be able to look through and think, okay, I love the authenticity. Nowhere in here is it say, okay, add a teaspoon of MSG to this. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's one of those things that I absolutely love every kind of Asian cuisine you can think of. Um, did have one bad experience in my life, but who hasn't? Um, you know, there, but by and large, I mean, I'm looking at this book and I'm like, I can't believe how you captured everything you just described there and probably a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's not barren of pictures because honestly you eat with your eyes first. So the pictures seem very well done and the recipe is not so convoluted that, you know, somebody like me couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, Michelle, she's really going to be the one at the end of the day in this household. So she pre-ordered one. She had to have it. I think she got it. I think on the way home, she actually pre-ordered a copy right there. So we're going to have to tell everybody <laughs> out there great. where they can go to get this, because I know this thing, why don't you give us the details on that? I mean, can they buy this now? Can they get it off the shelf? Can they get it at Chelsea Green? Or can they pre-order it? Because uh, that's really the best way to go about it at this point. What's the best way to get this thing? The best way to order it right now is through Amazon. <clears throat> so if you just look up the Nourishing Asian Kitchen, um, I also have a bit.ly, you know, slash Nourishing Asian. And it takes you to the sales page for the pre-orders where I have bonuses. I show you how to, if you pre-order and it's only up until... Uh, December 1st. But if you pre-order between now and then, I am giving out a video where it's a Japanese style of cutting up and piecing out your chicken. So you'll like, you, Michelle will appreciate it where you clean all the entire chicken out and you leave the carcass whole. 
So you're not having to dull your blade and cut through all the bones. It's nice and clean. And you take that carcass and you put it into your stock pot and you make broth right away. So, you know, it's, I've, I've lived this way with my mom for 40 years now where she really taught me how to eat nose to tail, right? I, I had to use, we had to use it. We had to use the feet. We had to use the neck. We had to use the bones <clears throat> before it was cool. In fact, it was something I couldn't really share with my friends at school that I ate chicken feet or chicken neck, you know, or like, ew, that's gross. But now amongst the homesteading crowd, I'm, I, I think it's a cool thing to know now where people are like, what am I supposed to do? But not just homesteading because chicken feet, chicken liver and chicken heart are now available at Whole Foods. And what I hear all the time is, how do I cook it? What do I do with it? And that's where I feel, you know, I can come in and help guide you to how to cook with all of that, because it's the most nutrient dense way of eating. It's a healing. It's for your health. Food is medicine. And we've completely just convoluted this whole thing. And we've traded our conveniences to to for our health. And that's that's really, you know, we need to take back. We need to take that back. Yeah, we're definitely victims of comfort. Uh, yeah. No doubt about that. And then sometimes it really takes the crucible of really hard times for people to wake that up or to wake up and recognize this is exactly what's going on in these, in these uh, days. I'm just floored at how young you two are and how many different careers and how many things you've encompassed all of these years. I mean, if I didn't know y'all were Asian, I would have thought y'all were Jamaicans, man. <laughs> this many jobs. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> cool. How you've been able to bring it all to bear Mm -hmm. And how you're out there hustling. You're doing good things. Um, okay, so we got the book. We also have the real estate business. Um, I guess we can we can include all this stuff down below. But do you have a YouTube channel or any other presence that they can find you on where if they want to find out more information about what you're doing? Yeah, you can follow us day to day on Instagram.com, you know, slash sprinkle with soil. Um, we chose sprinkle with soil because it's a play off of sprinkle with salt, you know, when you finish a dish, but we also talk about not just Asian nourishing food, but we also talk about, you know, Asian farming as well and how it's a closed loop circle, you know? So like we were just at the back to the land uh, festival where we talked about obviously nourishing food, but how do we now take that food and bring it back and regenerate the soil and build soil health? So we really don't waste anything. Um, so yeah, so we're on, uh, we have a YouTube channel. We're starting to just build that up. We started it a couple of years ago for fun during, you know, the pandemic, but, um, we have a couple of videos there that just naturally went viral. Like we did a tour of our homestead in California and then, you know, our transition the first year here. Um, and so, yeah, where can they find that where, where can they, or what yeah, channel? that's a uh, YouTube and at sprinkle with soil as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we have the website sprinklewithsoil.com. And, and then we have a call to farms podcast too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like that name, man. That is, that is almost as good as permaculture pimp cast. <laughs> no, it really is. I love it. I love it. I mean, you know, army kind of thing, call to farms. Yeah. So it's a podcast. Uh, what do you discuss on the podcast? Well, we talk about our journey, but we also interview other people that are in within our network and who mentors of ours who have kind of sh shown us the ropes because, you know, we'll be the first to admit we don't know. We don't know everything. We're we're just trying to find we know kind of like uh, you understand, Billy, like, you know, like find the SMEs out there and just be willing to learn. And we want to do that. And we're kind of applying the spirit of Silicon Valley of just being open and just kind of sharing that knowledge. So once we've gained that knowledge, we want to be able to share it with our, our listeners, too, so that they can get started in homesteading. We're just like one step ahead of them, really. And we just want to be able to help them so that they don't have to repeat any of the mistakes that we made. Well, careful, because one of those secrets of Silicon Valley is micro dosing, as I understand it. Obviously. <laughs> so. We're not taking. We're not taking all that stuff out. Yeah, we're not taking all of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and both of you work in this podcast together, I guess, on the Call to Farms. Yeah, we do. We yeah. work. We both work on it. Uh, it was kind of something fun, but uh, I kind of taken control of it, and uh, it, it's it's more of a passion now. And actually, by doing this, it's actually been a great lead source too, because a lot of people have been listening in on our podcast. They want to get to learn more about homesteading and they're they're reaching out to me to ask questions and to help them find land so yeah. it's been great and your website is homesteadingrealtor.com 
homesteadingrealtor.com. We'll be sure to link everything down below, y'all. Um, I got to say, is, is there anything else you two would like to add before we come to a close here? Because it's been a real fun. It's been a lot of fun here. No, yeah. we just we can't wait to meet up with you, too. Yeah. Uh, we want to check out your place. We'd love to just pick your brain and love to. Yeah. Or, or come over and I'll cook for Michelle. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. what? You know, you got me. You had me a duck fat fries right off that right <laughs> off the bat. Hey, y'all, it's been a joy. Be sure to go check them out. You got to get this book. I'm telling you, it is unlike any other cookbook you're going to find out there. Plus, you're supporting somebody out there that's just like you. All right, y'all. Hopefully, that's been a blessing to you. And text ne Until next time, stay alert, stay alive.